Hello and welcome to this short video brought to you by tutor to you This video is going to be looking at the AQA A-Level Specification for Psychology and in particular we are going to be recapping research methods and sampling. So before we begin to look at the different sampling techniques that you need to be aware of, let's take a look at populations and samples. So what is a population and more specifically what is the target population? So your target population is the large group of individuals that the researcher may be interested in studying, for example, secondary school teachers. Now, for practical and financial reasons, it might not be possible to study all of your chosen target population. Given the example of secondary school teachers within the UK itself, we have thousands, and therefore a smaller group within this target population must be studied. This smaller group is your sample. Ideally, the sample that is drawn will be representative of the target population so that findings can then be generalised. Now, how do we select our samples? So samples are selected using a sampling technique that aims to produce a representative sample. The five sampling techniques that you need to know about, which are on the AQA specification, are random sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, opportunity sampling and volunteer sampling. Let's begin by recapping random sample. Now arguably this is one of the easiest sampling techniques to talk about. Random sampling gives every member of the target group an equal chance of being selected for the sample. So we might assign a number to each member and then select them from a pool using a random number generator. That tends to be the most common method. Or you might put names in a hat and then randomly pull out these names in order to select your sample. For each of the sampling techniques that you study in psychology, you also need to be able to evaluate them. So that is pulling out the strengths and the limitations. So we've got a few strengths and limitations here. So the first strength with random sampling is that it is widely accepted that since each member has the same probability of being selected, because if you're using a random number generator or simply pulling names out of the hat, you are obviously pulling this out at random, everyone has got an equal chance, there's a reasonable chance of achieving a representative sample. A second strength is that it's free from researcher bias because the researcher has no influence whatsoever over who is selected. However, there are also some limitations. So a limitation, small minority groups within your target group might distort results. Even with a random sampling technique, we still might pull out these small minority groups. And also it can be quite impractical or not possible to use a completely random technique. For example, the target group might be too large to assign numbers to. So now we're moving on from random sampling and we're going to take a look at systematic sampling. So a systematic method is chosen for selecting from a target group. For example, in a systematic sample, every fourth person in a list could be used in the sample. So if you were studying psychology students, you might take a class register or a year group list of students and go down that list and choose every fourth or fifth person. Now, every time you get to that fourth or fifth person, you make a note of their name or you will pull their name out and that person would take part in your sample. It differs from random sampling in that it does not give an equal chance of selection to each individual in the target group. Now, how might we evaluate systematic sampling? So a strength is, is that it involves minimal researcher bias as once the system for selection has been established, the researcher has no influence over who is chosen, gaining a representative sample. However, if the list has not been randomized, bias might still be present. So for example, if every fourth person in the list was a male, you might end up with only males in your sample. Moving on to your third sampling technique, this is stratified sampling. A lot of people get scared when they see the term stratified sampling come up in the exam, but it's really not too difficult. Stratified sampling simply involves the sampler dividing or stratifying the target group into sections, each showing a key characteristic which should be present in the final sample. Then, each of those sections is sampled individually. The sample thus created should contain members from each key characteristic in a proportion representative of the target population. Now, if you're going to evaluate stratified sampling, what might you write about? 
Now, these questions seem to be quite common when you are given a STEM within research methods sections of your paper. You are asked to identify the sampling technique used by the researcher and then asked to identify a strength or a limitation or both of that sampling technique. So a strength is, is that it avoids the problem of misrepresentation sometimes caused by purely random sampling. However, it definitely takes more time and resources to plan and care must be taken to ensure that each key characteristic present in the population is selected across strata. Otherwise, this will design a biased sample. Here we have our penultimate sampling technique, opportunity sampling. Now this one is nice and easy. Opportunity sampling basically just means that participants who are both accessible and willing to take part are targeted. For example, employees from a conveniently located employer near the laboratory could be selected from the sample group. Or if you were a teacher wanted to carry out a study, you might ask your students as they are readily available to you. Or you might walk down to the sixth form common room and approach students there. Certainly, the biggest strength of opportunity sampling is that this method is convenient, easy and also very inexpensive to carry out. However, the consequent sample might not be representative as it could be subject to bias. The target population is drawn from a very specific area, for example, one street or one town, one sixth form, one cafe, and therefore findings can't be generalised. Also, the researcher has complete control over the selection of participants, so research bias is possible. In other words, it is up to the researcher who takes part in the experiment or in the study, and therefore they have complete control over who they would like to choose. Finally, we have volunteer sampling. So here the sample consists of people who have volunteered to be in the study. This could be by responding to newspaper adverts or on a common room notice board, or by simply raising their hands when the researcher asks for volunteers. People often get confused between volunteer and opportunity sampling. The main thing to remember is with volunteer sampling, the participants themselves have actively seeked the researcher, responded to an advert, responded to a hands up in the classroom, responded to a notice on a notice board, and they are actively seeking out the researcher to say that they would like to take part. Opportunity sampling, the participants are very often approached by the researcher. So finally, what's good about volunteer samples? Well, they often achieve a large sample size through reaching a wide audience, for example, with online advertisements. You quite often see this in university students' dissertations. They might post an advert on Facebook asking people to respond to a survey or asking people to take part in their study. Now, obviously, with social media, we can approach thousands of people. And even if just a small percentage of those people respond, we're still able to gain a very large sample size, therefore, hopefully making it more representative. It's also easy for the researcher. It saves the researcher a lot of time. They just put the advert out there and the participants come to them. However, a limitation is those who respond to the call for volunteers might all display similar characteristics, such as being more trusting or cooperative than those who didn't apply thus increasing the chances of yielding an unrepresentative sample. We call this volunteer bias, so the type of participants we are obtaining for our sample are all very similar. Thank you for watching this AQA A-Level Psychology video brought to you by Tutor2U, which focused on research methods and sampling techniques.